Hello, everyone, and thank you uh, for everyone that's joined us so far. We're going to wait just a few more minutes for some other folks that might be still joining us this afternoon. Um, hopefully, you can hear me. If you can't, please use your chat box and you can chat. We have some um, technical support on the line with us also to hopefully get you connected via voice so you can hear us. And we should get started here in just a few moments. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. We'll go ahead and get started today on our webinar session on effective business communication. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Um, so before we kind of get started, I just wanted to let you know of a brief agenda with our hour together this afternoon. Um, we will be recording the webinar, so there will be a link available for you about 24 hours after this session concludes, and you'll get that link automatically through our system. So you can review the session again, or you can feel free to share that link, too, with any coworkers or friends you feel may be interested in the content that will be shared today. Um, regarding questions, please feel free to ask questions um, in the chat box. Uh, so anytime during the session, if you want to just jot down a question, we'll actually be addressing those towards the end of the presentation. And um, as I already said, the webinar link will be sent to you automatically via email that you can review it. Uh, so a few agenda items for today. Um, we'll be going over contact information uh, for myself and our presenter that we have with us here this afternoon. Um, Mary Louise Carlisle is our panelist and presenter, and she will give an introduction of herself and her history here with us at UC Irvine Extension and sharing with, her, with you all some of her expertise um, in the realm of business communication. Um, and then um, we'll go over some of uh, what, who we are here at UC Irvine Extension um, in our corporate education or corporate training department. And then we'll leave some room for an open forum of just some question and answer and discussion. So as I mentioned, my name is Missy Clayton. Um, I am the manager of our corporate education department here at UC Irvine Extension. And my contact information is listed there. Um, also listed is Natalie Blair, and she is our corporate communications manager in our department here with her information. So she has uh, an integral part of um, organizing these webinars that we put out for everybody. And um, also our PO box address, 
um, and fax information there, as well as our website URL, which is extension.uci.edu forward slash corporate. If you have an interest in learning a little bit more about what our department does and who we are and who our um, corporate partners are that we work with here. So if you have any questions um, after the session about any of the content that we've covered, please feel free to reach out to me or Natalie. We'd be happy to help you. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Mary Louise Carlisle, who will be our panelist today. And she can give you an introduction of herself, and then we can kind of start getting into um, the, the crux of what we want to share with you, which is effective business communication. So Mary Louise. Okay, thanks, Missy. Hi, uh, my name is Mary Louise Carlisle, and I'm delighted to be here. I've been working with UCI and Extension uh, teaching communication skills classes for over 12 years now, and I do a variety of different tasks around communication skills. My area of expertise is really uh, twofold. I uh, teach people how to interact more effectively in the world of work uh, interpersonally, and that's one-on-one -on -one in a team environment, um, interpersonal relationships, and everything that that entails. And then I have another area of expertise uh, in business writing, and that has to do with uh, how you look on in your emails, what kinds of documents you write, and how they reflect you as a professional. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about in this uh, overview is how I begin most of my classes when I, when I teach communication skills. I like to start with sort of a foundation, a very general, broad foundation of communication skills and how they uh, count and, or how they're valued in the world of work. And so what I usually do with the group that I'm working with is I have this kind of a, a, a question, a list of questions, and they're just statements, and it's not really anything that's uh, true or false and it's uh, an accurate uh, answer, it's just getting us thinking about the, the world of communication skills. And so the first one that I talk about in my class is that we have this idea that more communication is better. And so we talk around that, that comment a lot. So often we think that in, in so many areas of our lives that more, if anything, more money, more time, more vacation, more is always better. And I, I, have to, uh, I have to clarify that sometimes in the world of communication skills, m more isn't always better. And m more isn't what, not the, whole, the whole world isn't waiting for you to talk to them more or to write to them more. And actually, in uh, some of the things that we talk about, there's, there's this, this skill that I share, and that is reading people. And if you can read people, which I do cover in this class, if you can read people, you can find out that there's uh, half the world doesn't want more communication. Half the world is, is, is pretty happy with a yes or a no. So we talk a little bit about that, and I expand on that in my class. And then the idea that effective communication is a natural ability. Uh, obviously, when we get evaluated uh, yearly in performance reviews, we look at communication skills, and that's a major category. And it's not really a, a natural ability, but what I try to to stress in my class is that it's actually a skill and that in order to be effective communicators, we need to practice, just like if you're learning how to ski or if you're learning how to play the piano. So I give a lot of examples of how we can put into practice and try to, on purpose, uh, improve that with um, practicing that skill and, and getting practice at it so we don't avoid opportunities to, to get some uh, improved skills. The uh, next one that we talk about is uh, how people evaluate us, and uh, I ask the class very often to evaluate me quickly since they've just met me, and I am often surprised and usually happy with the, the quick evaluation. But the truth is, is that we're all evaluated quickly, immediately uh, by others, and that one of the ways that that happens is through the area of communication, and that communication involves how you look how you present yourself, um, what you say, and that all of those things add up very quickly to how other people perceive you. And how you're perceived in the world of work is really uh, how you get your goals met because 
the more uh, the the more credible that you're perceived, and uh, the uh, higher you're evaluated, uh, the more you get your goals met. And we really we dive deep into uh, into that area as well. And then the last one is just within interpersonal work relationships. Not talking to somebody can still send a message. And I do kind of a visual of what an interpersonal work relationship network looks like. And I talk about how <clears throat> sometimes people don't send messages and how ignoring somebody that's within your interpersonal network can actually uh, send a message. And uh, we, we talk about that and we do kind of a visual, uh, a picture of the people that, that you work with and how those are the relationships that need to be managed in the world of work. Okay, the next thing that we talk about in my class is uh, the elements of a message. And this is a fun chart that I've, I've used for some time. It's uh, from Albert Moravian. He's a UCLA, uh, he's a UCLA uh, uh, researcher who I believe is still alive. He came up with this dynamic of three different elements of a message. And he said that when we communicate, primarily in face-to-face -face communication, that there's three different elements of the message that's going on. And one of the elements is uh, a visual component. And so the visual component is the 55% piece that you can see there. That's the biggest piece. And that has to do with your eye contact and your facial expression and your posture and uh, the space that you build between yourself and others. And it also has to do with um, your, the expression on your face is the, the place that gets the most, uh, that picks up the most data from others. And so I try to stress in the class that whatever facial expression that you wear is really the, the, the most comprehensive data that people can pick up from you. So we talk a lot about visual. And then the next one is vocal. And vocal is the speed with which you speak or the pitch how much emotion you talk with or not, uh, whether you talk in a steady voice or whether you put a lot of energy in your voice. And uh, I know recently uh, I've been paying a lot of attention to this up-talking trend where people talk up and they go like that when they talk. And so we do a little bit about that, kind of a valley girl uh, up-talk tone of voice, which I... I I believe completely that it's it's not a credible, uh, effective communication skill. And then the last piece is just the 7%, and that's the verbal part of the message. And it's so surprising because it's the smallest piece of what other people perceive. Uh, and yet they're taking a look at your visual and your vocal, which is the 93% of, of all your message. So it really, really comes down to how you say things and how you craft your message, whether it's in uh, in uh, in a way more than uh, in an incredible way more than what you say verbally and so a couple of the things that I build on with regard to this this visual is that if you think about somebody who's an effective communicator and uh, when they speak there isn't any confusion and there's clarity it's most likely because the three elements of their message are all congruent and so whatever it is that they're saying, they're saying it uh, and it all, it all fits together. When people uh, speak in a way that is sarcastic or they're trying to be passive aggressive or they're saying something in a way <clears throat> that isn't credible, it's because what they're saying doesn't match the way that they're saying it. And so we speak a lot, we talk a lot about that and uh, talk about how to deliver a difficult message even if uh, uh, it's a difficult message or bad news so that your visual and your vocal match, so that you have the skills to make the message congruent. Okay. Uh, another part um, of my class that I like to um, share is that we have so many different choices when we communicate in, in the world of work. And so this is like a, a visual that I, um, I like to show and that we have these different channels and these different choices of, of how we communicate uh, with others. And so you, if you look at the very top, you can see that person to person, if we laid like another lens on top of this, you could see that person to person 
as um, you can you can listen to the person, you can um, get immediate feedback face to face, you can hear the words, you can pick up their nonverbal cues to see if their message your message is getting reached or not. You can uh, pick up their, their their tone of voice, and you really have a maximum channel of communication when you're dealing with somebody uh, person to person. If you go down the list and you look at email. Uh, email really is the least effective way to communicate with people on a regular basis because you've lost so many of the different degrees of context. You've actually lost the nonverbal cue, you've lost the tone of voice, you've lost uh, the immediate feedback, and so what you're left with when you email someone is strictly the words. And so I, I really stress in my classes that email is not always your, your best choice to communicate with other people. And, and in fact, if you wanted to really uh, uh, limit your email use, it would be good to just consider that email works best when you're sending data to another person because data can't be misunderstood and it's difficult to misinterpret uh, you know, facts or, or statistics. And so I think that when you're dealing with uh, email, that's why a lot of people have started to add expressions like LOL or a little happy face because they're, they're so uh, limited by the kind of uh, the way that the, the message is received, they don't want to be misinterpreted. So there's, there's, there's got to be a way to add uh, some kind of an emotion. And so the other thing with email is that it's enormously time consuming because your, your fear of being misinterpreted is so huge because you've lost the other channels. So if we're going to use email, I, I give some tips on, on how to use that effectively so that it doesn't turn into such an a, a enormous a, a time a waster or time eater. Okay. So Mary Louise, along that same vein, when would when would you recommend someone, especially in a work environment, you know, picking up the phone and using the phone or, you know, using a voicemail for someone if they're not at their desk? Can you can you give some tips about that? Sure. And I, um, it's great that I'm with Missy today because Missy and I have established a, a telephone kind of a, a culture between the two of us. When we first started working together many years ago, um, we started to um, have emails and I wanted to develop another relationship with her and it, I knew that it wouldn't happen through email and so I would schedule times to talk with you and I do that in other cases. And so I, I, you do that to develop rapport and if there's somebody that you deal with on a regular basis and you want to set aside time to deal with them and to create a connection and rapport with them, it's a good idea to uh, set up a time or when would be a good time for us to talk about X, X, and X and ask people um, what way they prefer to communicate with you and to, to, to leave voicemails to set up times. So often I see people in uh, LinkedIn uh, connections and I think, I, I, I wouldn't want all of my LinkedIn connections to only know me via email. I would want my LinkedIn connections, as we're, you know, we're moving towards so much LinkedIn and so much social media, I would like a variety of different ways for people to know me and not just, it's so much more dimensional than just strictly email. So whenever you can, whenever it makes sense, your best choice is person to person. If you're going to try to persuade somebody or if you want to request resources or if you wanted to ask for time or, or staff, or, 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 or funds, your best bet always in a persuasive uh, conversation is to deal with them person to person. If the worst is, is email. Great, thank you. And if anyone, if these, are, if these are sparking any questions, please feel free again to use the chat um, Q&A box and we'll address those towards the end of this session today. So one of the things that I uh, that I cover in my class is that I, I do like a, a baseline of sort of self-awareness. And what we're going to do in this class is we're going to have um, a, a very uh, simple assessment, and it measures how people behave in the work environment. And so a couple of points about this. This is a great quote uh, from a book that I use called People Styles at Work. But uh, we're, t we're going to take a look at not somebody's personality, but how you behave in different situations. And when you talk about people in the world of work, there's three different aspects of their behavior that's important to point out. And one is uh, that uh, behavior that we use in the world of work is a choice. So we choose how we're going to behave. 
And uh, another one about behavior in the world of work is that we behave differently uh, in different environments. So I might be very extroverted um, in my personal life and then I go to work and I'm very quiet and, and introverted. So depending upon the environment, sometimes we shift, sometimes we don't. It depends. Everybody's a little bit different. And then the third aspect of behavior that's important to keep in mind is that it's observable in other people. So I try to make it real clear that we're not trying to read people's personalities. That's complex, that's complicated, that's almost undoable. But if you just pick up some skills of reading people, then you can make adjustments on how you read them and how you can respond to them to again develop rapport and to get your goals met. So I start with this grid of four, and interesting about people, there's always a grid of four, and if you look at any major kind of assessment that looks at behavior or personality, the Myers-Briggs is four. The, uh, the kinds of blood we have is four. I think that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. There's four kinds of blood types. And I was just uh, listening to something recently on health, and it said, in our heart, we have four major uh, parts to our heart. So there's something about the magic number of four when it comes to people. And so this is a grid, and it could be any four. There's lots of different um, assessments, but this is a grid that's used by what I use as a DISC, and it stands for the dominant, the influential, the conscientious, and the steadfast style of behavior. It's not a personality. And so what I do is um, you, you'll find out in the class, you'll find out what it is that that you, how you behave at work and how you are mostly in work environments, and then it'll help you understand the differences and the contrast with others so that you can um, respond in a way just like the quote says. So you can flex, and um, depending upon what's coming at you, you can respond in a way that works to meet your goals. So just quickly, the D is a dominant and they're focused on task and their primary uh, focus at work and currency is, is getting results. So this is somebody who wants to speak very quickly, they, they want to um, get to the bottom line, they don't want to have a long conversation with you, they don't want to hear about your weekend, <laughs> they want you to not waste their time, they want it, you to get in and get out and they're they're very um, they're very uh, future oriented um, workers, and so very often because they can get results, they're often put in charge of others because they delegate and they're about productivity. Uh, they're very efficient and practical and independent. So that's a particular um, behavior. Uh, profile. The, ne the next one is an influential style, and that's somebody who's very extroverted also, but instead of being focused on results, this person and tasks, this person is more interested in people. So they're very much about the who and the social aspects of work. So they're very animated and enthusiastic and emotional, and they're talkative, and they're the ones that want to stand and have a cup of coffee with you on a Monday morning and rehash the weekend. So those are two different styles, and how you communicate with those styles really uh, is different, and it's important to make those distinctions. The second half are conscientious and steadfast, and these two now are more introverted styles. And uh, this conscientious, their primary currency is accuracy. So they're very interested in things of quality and things being exact and a lot of order and a lot of structure and they're introverted uh, folks and they're focused on the task. So they want things to be in sequence and, and uh, complete and thorough and they're happy to look at a lot of data uh, for backup and they have a, a slower pace. This is now somebody that moves at a little slower pace. And then the last one is steadfast. And steadfast uh, style of person is someone who is also an introvert and they move a little slower through the world um, because that's their preferred mode, and their primary focus and currency is on harmony. They like things to be the status quo. They like to, they they like things to go smoothly. They don't like anything unexpected. So we we dive into those four different styles based on on individuals, and then we figure out what's the best way to connect with them as they show up in your world of work. 
Okay. The next uh, visual that I have up for you is kind of a toolbox that I put together. And at the at the bottom of the toolbox is a is a communication skills, which I think is the foundation for uh, your building building your communication skills and figuring out. Well, let's see. I I need to listen. I need to speak. I need to read, and I need to write. That's how I'm evaluated. Where am I strong in those areas? Where could I improve? Uh, to, to meet my goals. And so beneath that communication skills foundation is sort of a self-awareness of what is it that I need to work on based on my workplace and the dynamic that goes on where I work. The next part up is I, I talk about uh, interpersonal styles, the basic three styles, uh, which are aggressive, assertive, and passive. And these, and also within that is embedded um, a, a passive-aggressive style. These are three uh, styles of how people interact on an individual uh, behave, in individual basis. So you might uh, have a very aggressive relationship with dynamic with somebody, uh, and then you might be in a passive situation with another person. So this is a result uh, of the individual relationship. We spend quite a bit of time with this because I, I think that outside of understanding the way that you communicate and your style and your preferred way of communicating, we spend a lot of time on this because I think this is such an underutilized skill, uh, toolbox skill. And I'm reminded of uh, the book by Sheryl Sandberg called Lean In. And she talks about women being able to negotiate and women being able to you know, make their mark and, 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 and get ahead. And, and I find in, in my years of teaching in the workplace that there's a lot of people, not just women, but a lot of people are, are not even able to ask in an assertive way for what they need. So before we all can lean in, and I think that that's great, and, you know, I applaud her for thinking that through, I think women and men need to be able to ask for what it is that they want and to be clear and to communicate uh, clearly and to be understood. And so we spend a good amount of time talking about the difference. There's quite a bit of um, confusion about aggressiveness and assertiveness, and there's a little bit of... Uh, uh, overlap in some people's eyes, and yet when you really look at it clearly, there's no overlap at all. They're completely, completely separate. And we talk a little bit about um, strategies on how to respond to situations in an assertive way or how to initiate uh, a conversation in an assertive way. And I do a lot of uh, role playing and um, uh, tips and strategies and, and practices around. Uh, working through assertiveness. Okay, and then the, the top is uh, dealing with conflict. And uh, conflict is a, a great topic to deal with because to deal with it is to face it and to recognize that so many of us deal with conflict at work uh, in many of the ways that we were raised. We, we the, Whatever conflict model we were raised with or that we, uh, we were... Uh, exposed to as children, that's that's very often that's what we take into the world of work. And so very often it doesn't work. It's not effective. And so I give a lot of skills and break down ways to to recognize what conflict is, what's the basis of it, uh, not to be afraid of it, that it can actually have a productive a value. It doesn't always have to be destructive. And that uh, beneath everything related to a conflict and basic and personal styles, the, the, the more uh, savvy and uh, expressive communicator you are, the better you're going to be able to resolve your conflicts. And Mary Louise, around that topic of conflict, do you feel like there's a certain way that you would approach a situation that you feel like you are going to be in conflict, would you let that individual know you're going, you know, you wanted to sit down and have a conversation with them about something um, and set the framework? Is there a certain way that you might advise people? Sure. Um, well, the first thing that I, that I um, ask is, is that once you learn um, the basics and the ease with which it is to just read a, a person, and to figure out where, where they are and what their behavior is, that can really drive how you respond to them with a conflict. Because not everybody does conflict the same. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, it's important to figure out where that person, uh, where where it is that you know that they're coming from in their conflict and how they might uh, perceive it. So, so one of the other things that we do is we break down uh, the different four styles. And so, I would approach a conflict perhaps with a D style, somebody who's probably going to be aggressive, uh, you know, at the outset. I would approach a conflict with them a bit differently than I would with somebody who's their primary uh, method of dealing with conflict is to avoid it, mm -hmm. and they're uncomfortable with it. So, depending upon who I would be dealing with, I would. Uh, I would take a different approach um, based on the situation, based on the weight of the situation and how big a deal it, it is. And one of the things that I say often in conflict is that um, it's inevitable where we're not really given great skills to deal with it. It's mm -hmm. going to happen, and I have conflict. Mm -hmm. It happens to me too. It isn't that now that I know about it, it doesn't happen to me. But what happens is the more you know about it, the better prepared you are so that you can sift through some skills and think about, okay, I could use this skill or I could use that skill and I can practice it. And then after I experience that conflict, I can look back on it and say, what, what part of that worked for me and what part of it didn't. Okay. Okay, so in working with others, this just uh, speaks a little bit to what we were talking about with uh, right now with dealing with conflict, once you've identified the different kinds of styles, you, you can recognize their moods. And so we go style by style and we, we do a, an overview of, okay, so even if it, even if it uh, is sending an email, uh, you know, if you're sending an email and what do you need to recognize about a D style? A D style doesn't want a greeting, they don't want recognize, they want you to not waste their time, so they want to get in and out acknowledge that, uh, you know, that they're going to maybe sometimes appear that they are abrupt or they could appear harsh and so often it, it's not personal. And so what are some of the ways that we want to communicate with that style? And I've seen time after time after time that this just really works. And if we just remove ourselves from the equation and think about what works for them, then things go much, much more uh, smoothly. And so you want to communicate with them in short bullets, very direct uh, and very brief. And, uh, you know, be brief and be gone because they want to get on to the rest of their day. And then we talk about the red flags. So, you know, what are some things that we can do so that we can have productive uh, conflict with them? And how do we stay in the conflict and uh, communicate with them so that we come out of it on the other side? And then we do the same thing with the I style. You know, what do we need to recognize about them? How are they different? And uh, how we, we want to communicate? You know, something as simple as an email. You would say uh, their name, you know, hi, Missy, or say hello to them and give them some kind of a greeting because that's customizing a message for them, which is really effective. And what are some of the red flags that we need to deal with? So if we have a conflict with an I, we can resolve it in a productive way. And then the conscientious, you know, I, I, I've taught a lot of engineers through the years, and one of my favorite um, engineers said to me that uh, he didn't want he didn't want to <laughs> he didn't want anybody to give him a gift because he didn't want to have to say thank you. <laughs> so that these are <laughs> this is a group that doesn't want to communicate. Less is better on, on the interpersonal level. So knowing that is is helpful, or even knowing that and being able to laugh about that is is helpful. So, and what are some of the red flags that happens to someone that's conscientious? They're not interested often in working and uh, interacting on a team. So, how do we work our way around that, and, and how do we get the best of them if they're on our team, or if we work for uh, that style? How do we get the best and still get our uh, needs met and our goals met? And then the last one is steadfast. And so uh, how do we uh, recognize the steadfast? How do we make sure that we give them an opportunity to communicate in a way that they feel comfortable so that we can work with them? Because remember, these are folks that are, that are very loyal and they're dependable and they show up for work and they work hard and we want to make sure they do that. But often they don't want to deal with conflict because it's, uh, it's somehow represents something that's not stable to them. 
So that's a different approach with that style so that we can communicate with them in a way that is consistent and it's okay for them to bring us a problem because we need, we need problems to be uh, addressed. Okay. okay. So what we would do then at the end of our class is we would uh, take a look at um, uh, your interpersonal relationships and, and evaluate them. So wh what's your style and where are some of the issues that you have, maybe with your supervisor, maybe with your uh, coworkers, maybe with your team, maybe with your subordinates, and to think about what's working well and what needs to be improved. Where, where could... what? Where could uh, some areas be for improvement and what are the situations? And so then we would create an action plan, a very clear, uh, um, itemized action plan of what needs to be improved and get very specific. How do we need to interact with them, providing information? So often I talk to people and I ask them, you know, have you ever asked your supervisor, what's the best way for me to give you information? Some people want a spreadsheet. Some people want, you know, coffee on a Friday. Some people want, you know, a hallway conversation. And so often supervisors don't let their uh, subordinates know what's the best way for them to provide information. So that's an important question. Providing information. There's the lens of uh, what people prefer, and then there's the lens also of, you know, uh, different age groups you know, provi uh, provide information in, in different ways. And so um, there's all those factors to consider. Uh, we'll take a look at feedback and we'll talk about uh, how do you provide feedback and how do you receive feedback. It's, it's a fact of life in the world. Uh, feedback happens, you know, all in all uh, areas of work. And so how can you use it, not personalize it, and uh, move forward with it in a positive way? And then we talk about resolving conflict. You know, who are the people that are in your interpersonal network that you either avoid conflict with and that's not always the best approach? Uh, how are you managing the conflict? Uh, what steps need to be taken in order to uh, d detail that conflict and improve on it? And uh, then we talk about priorities and what's the next things that you need to work on. One of the things I like to say to folks is that you don't want the same issues now that in a year that you have. Uh, hopefully, if you're growing and you're getting outside your comfort zone, you're, you're, you're going to look at new issues, new challenges. And so the ones that are in front of you today, you want to handle so that in a year from now, you're handling a different group of challenges and priorities. Great. So thank you so much, Mary Louise, for all that wonderful information. I think that was um, really informative. Um, I always love to hear what you have to say about how to how to communicate better in the workplace and just you know in general. Um, so I just wanted to share. So again, if you have some questions for Mary Louise that you would like for her to answer, uh, maybe you're you know currently experiencing a challenge in the workplace or otherwise surrounding communication and want some advice or you just have a question about some of the material that she has covered today, please feel free to um, communicate that either in the chat box. There's also a Q&A box, but we will check both. Um, in the meantime, we'll go over just some general information. So um, the first slide here is about mini courses. So this is a, a new little program that we put together from our corporate education department. Um, that was really kind of derived out of a need that we were seeing with some of our um, corporate business partners that we work with in the training and education realm, and that they were looking for shorter bites of just real condensed information. So with our courses here in our campus, you know, mostly they run over consecutive weeks, um, and sometimes folks are just too busy and they can't take, you know, a, a six-week long course, so we thought it would be great to be offering you some additional options to kind of power pack in a lot of really great content into a short amount of time. So if you like what you heard from Mary Louise and you want to know more about what your behavior style is, um, you can actually attend her mini course, which will be upcoming here at our campus October 4th and 11th. Those are Fridays. Um, you can come learn more with her, learn more from her. Um, we provide breakfast and lunch. for So it's kind of a mini networking opportunity also. Um, and if you want to enroll, enrollment is open, you can go to the link noted there on the bottom, which is extension.uci.edu forward slash mini. Um, so mini course topics, we're doing a lot of different topics, um, but here's an overall 
um, look at what would be covered in this mini course. So we're just going to be doing a deeper dive into what Mary Louise has breezed over in this um, short view with us together. So if you want to know more, I would highly encourage you to attend the session. Um, so who should take this mini course? Really, we advise anyone who's, you know, from a manager to a supervisor, if you want to learn better how to communicate with your subordinates, deal with conflict, provide feedback. Um, sometimes as a manager or supervisor, you know, it's hard to deliver a difficult message to an employee when you want to coach them or, you know, you see a job performance um, that you, you want to curtail. So it's a great opportunity to learn more skills surrounding that. Um, anyone in the leadership position, project managers, um, anyone who's a project manager, you know, you're working on teams, you're having to do um, what Mary Louise spoke about, influence, and how best to influence decision makers when you're working on a project. So anyone who really wants to build more effective relationships, um, if you want to get over conflict in the workplace, how to better address conflict, and really just to get an overall um, better understanding and, and movement towards being a more effective communicator. So our mini courses, as I mentioned, um, they're really power packed um, sessions that we put on either one or two days total for our mini courses. Um, we have a variety of topics that we're starting to offer and we do offer them on Fridays. So they're full Fridays. Come to our campus, we'll provide you breakfast and lunch um, and you sit down and you learn very concentrated topic areas in the mini courses. So our goal is that you walk away with really some, some great tools um, that you can apply in your workplace or in your life after the session. So here's a list of some of our upcoming mini courses that we have scheduled. Um, first step coming up quickly is a social media um, mini course. Um, then we also have a critical chain one, which is more on the project management side. And then of course, Mary Louise's that we are excited about because it's going to be power packed, lots of information shared, business communication one. Um, and then you can see we have an agile and then digital marketing. So we offer a lot of different topic areas from technical to more of the soft skills communications mini courses. So public course offerings, um, alongside our mini courses, we do offer a full certificate program of, along the same vein of what Mary Louise was talking about, which is our organizational leadership and communication certificate program. It is available 100% online. Um, if you do have colleagues from your organization who might be interested in attending the online, we can extend a 10% discount on your course fee if you have three or more employees attend. Um, and of course, with our corporate education department, what we specialize in is bringing our courses, our instructors on site to your company. If you have a group of about 12 students that want to take any of our courses you see existing on our campus, um, but what we really specialize in is customizing that course to your exact learning needs in your organization, as well as customizing it to your company culture. So um, that's what we do in our corporate education department. So there's a lot of different options for you to continue to learn with us here at UCRN Extension. So at this point, we will go ahead and go through, move through the, the question and answer here that we have gotten from you. Thank you very much for your participation. Um, so we have a question, what is Mary Louise's DISC style and when does she need to flex the most? Well, <laughs> that's an interesting question and I, I, it's a smart question because it's directly applicable to all of us. And so my style is, uh, uh, depending on the environment that I'm in. So that, that that's the first answer. It depends on what environment I'm in. So that's with everybody. Some people are different styles in different situations. Let's take, for example, if I was to be your two-day instructor, I would be, uh, my style is very high I. I have a lot of enthusiasm. I'm very interactive. I exude a lot of energy and animation. Uh, let's see, and let's see, our question said my style, and then what else, let's see, we have... When do you need to flex the most? Oh, and let's see, her name is Dory. Dory, uh, when does she need to flex the most? Well, that's interesting, because 
when I'm not teaching, I'm doing a lot of research or I'm reading and writing and working on my preparations and getting ready for class. And so in that scenario, I wouldn't be an I, I'm more of a C, believe it or not. I'm very focused and introverted and quiet and uh, and very uh, un- um, Unteam like. So that's the, that's what, that's the style that I use in the world of work. However, I need to flex. When do I need to flex? I'll tell you that, uh, I need to flex the most often when I'm in a room of folks and most of them are looking at me with not a lot of expression on their face. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably when I need to flex the most because I recognize that based on my knowledge about this, I know that they're with me, but they're, they just didn't tell their face. Their face is not looking like they're with me. So that would be sometimes that I, I need to flex. So I don't know if that answers your question, uh, Dory. That sounds great. Thank you, Dory. Okay, so we have another question. We have another question. So when working in a male-dominated company, I find that I need to come off very assertive to get my point across, but I'm afraid of coming off as a mean person. But if I communicate too soft, I feel that I do not get taken seriously. Any suggestions to find a balance? Sure. That's a great question. Um, if we could just go back up just mm -hmm. one little bit there. Um, so uh, uh, the, what I would like to clarify for you, and as a result of taking my class, you would be real clear that you cannot be very assertive. And it, you, it, it's incompatible to be very assertive and to be mean. Uh, if you're assertive, that means that you're listening half of the time and you're speaking half the time. And so you have this personal power about you and it doesn't ever read off as mean. It means I'm going to take care of myself and hopefully uh, you will as well. So there's a little bit of confusion there, it seems like, in your definition of what assertive is. And that's one of the great things that I'd be able to clarify for you, is that you would come away from this understanding uh, that, you, that, you know, it's okay to be assertive, and if you are, in fact, assertive, mean does not enter into the equation. Aggressive is mean and can be perceived as mean, but assertive isn't. Assertive, when you're assertive, your goal is to be clear and to communicate and to solve a problem, and that doesn't, any, that doesn't get near a touching um, mean. So hopefully that's some ideas for you. So what, what would aggressive look like? Aggressive looks like one-way communication, and your goal is to control or to put the person down or to always uh, be, you know, in the spotlight. And so the message in uh, aggressive is, I'm going to talk and you're going to listen, and then when I'm done talking, we're done. So that's what aggressive looks like. And your, your goal, again, is to put the person down, and the subtle message is, I'm right and you're wrong, or I'm I'm superior and you're inferior. So that could be definitely be perceived as mean. And I give a lot of behaviors around what ag aggressive looks like. And so aggressive would look like maybe somebody who interrupts you all the time. That could be perceived as very aggressive, or somebody who doesn't uh, who cuts you off in a meeting is, is is an aggressive mood, or somebody who pounds the desk when they talk to you. That's aggressive, or somebody who maybe you know. Uh, says something negative or calls you a negative word or or whatever. Something that is um, based on them putting you down is aggressive. And that can be translated into mean. And I think there's so much miscommunication and misinformation about people uh, who, uh, the difference between assertive uh, uh, voice and an aggressive voice because they are completely, completely different. Great. So that's all we have for questions. Um, we will still be here online if you if you do have a question um, that that pops into your mind. Um, you know, Mary Louise would be happy to address that. Um, I just want to highlight a few more things about our corporate training of corporate education department. Um, we have been doing um, on-site training for companies for well over 15 years. Um, we actually work with a variety of different companies with a variety of different needs. Um, here local in our Orange County area as well as across the nation and internationally as well. So we have a vast reach. Um, if you feel you have a need for business communication, it's been a real popular topic that we've brought into a lot of companies, um, especially as Mary Louise mentioned, she's worked with a lot of technical companies, um, engineers, uh, IT folk who sometimes 
you know, communication skills and strategies aren't necessarily their innate skill um, because they like to crunch numbers and, and figure out how things work and how to make them work. So we have um, a lot, a variety of topics here, uh, curriculum that we can bring to your company if that would be of need. Um, and we also highly suggest and, and encourage you to attend our mini course with Mary Louise that will be coming up here in October. I uh, promise you won't be bored. Um, you will be greatly entertained and you'll walk away with some really fantastic information. So we'll hang on the line here for just a few more minutes to see if any other questions come through. Um, again, we will be receiving a recording of this uh, session that you can review and share with others you feel may be interested in what was shared today. In about 24 hours, you should be getting that link via email. And of course, uh, my contact information at the beginning of that slide, please feel free to email me or call me with any questions or comments you have about this session. And other than that, we really appreciate your time. You spending your lunch hour with us here today to learn a little bit more from Mary Louise about effective business communication skills. I wanted to make one more a, a point and share uh, one kind of an interesting thing that I brought to the class yesterday. I was teaching a class yesterday uh, for extension. And it's a survey that was done up at Stanford. They did a, a re, at the Stanford Research Institute did a survey uh, that's often quoted. And I, I think it's fascinating statistics. I didn't I didn't put it in my slides, but it just seems to uh, it just seems to really fit in right here. They asked about 200 executives up at uh, Silicon Valley. They said what contributes to somebody's a career success. And they had two categories of skills, and one skill was the hardware skill, the technical and uh, the technical skills uh, sets. And then on the other side, uh, they had communication skills and your interpersonal skills. And the averages were astounding. It was 12.7 for technical skills and hardware skills. That's what they saw as building to career success, which means approximately 80, between 80 and 83 percent were uh, they they collectively believed uh, were built around being able to have uh, interpersonal skills and to be able to effectively communicate and deliver the difficult message and all of those things. So there's a lot of research that supports this idea that 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 it's such an important part of your professional profile. That's great. Thank you, Mary Lee. You're welcome. So again, we'll hang on the line here for just a few more minutes. If anyone has any questions you'd like to put forth in that chat box in that um, or Q&A box, we will stay online for a few minutes and see if any more come through. Um, otherwise, again, thank you very much, everyone, for attending our session today. We appreciate you joining us. So it looks like we haven't had any other questions come through, so we'll go ahead and sign off for this afternoon. Again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us, and we hope to see you at the mini course coming up in October. Thanks, everybody.